If you, if you want your staff to be productive, you need to invest. It doesn't necessarily have to be a financial investment. It needs to be an investment in the person. So thank you for joining everyone. Welcome again. Uh, I'm Miriam. I'd love to introduce myself. I'm Miriam. I'm a learning consultant here at We School, and I'm the founder of Rolling Remotely, a one-stop for all things remote work. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Gemma, the Senior Education Manager at Oyster. Hi, everybody. I'm based in the UK. Um, I've been in the learning space for about 15 years. I started as a teacher with kids. Uh, went into adult education and then went into corporate education. So I'm looking forward to sharing my experiences with you today. Thank you so much, Gemma. So let's dive into today's workshop. The landscape of onboarding new hires into organizations is ongoing a transformative change, as we can imagine. And thanks in large part to several factors like the advancement in AI and technology, a focus on employee development and progress tracking, and the shift to flexible employee-centric workplace design. So organizations are increasingly recognizing the value of investing in continuous learning and uh, growth opportunities. And we're going to dive into those uh, today. Before that, we're going to look at some stats so as we can see, a small number of employees believe that their organizations are doing a great job at onboarding and 35% of companies don't spend any money on onboarding programs. 33% um, feel more engaged in organizations that have effective onboarding. We really need to focus on onboarding programs so that everybody feels involved and they feel like they're in a continuous learning uh, journey. So now I'd love to go ahead and start with a question to Gemma. Gemma, I'd love to hear your experience at Oyster. Um, do HR and team leaders work together on onboarding? And how do we encourage team leaders to engage onboarding in their new hires? So, so Moita, in terms of um, working together on onboarding, um, and in the space I'm in right now at Oyster, I'm blessed by the culture that we have there because it's so supportive and so focused on well-being. So the, the team leaders working with people team kind of starts um, right from the point of when we have that new hire application, which I think is really crucial. Successful onboarding, I know we're here to talk about onboarding, but for me it starts way back, right at the start where you're looking for that new hire and you're creating that great candidate experience. So in terms of kind of letting team leaders know that this is an expectation that they're going to be responsible for a, a proportion of onboarding, it's letting them know they're responsible for a proportion of new hire, that whole candidate experience. And when, when the onboarding happens, people team have been there to support them through finding the right hire. And then the magic starts of, of expectation setting for team leaders that now this person is with you, what are you going to do with them to make sure they succeed? So in terms of encouraging team leaders to do it, for me, it starts with culture. Like that's the foundation of everything. So if you've got a foundation that cares, if you've got a foundation of, of well-being, if you've got a foundation of like valuing growth, like then when your new hires are being planned for, the expectation of the team leaders is that these people are here to develop with your support. When I've, when I've seen it not work is when people are under pressure and managers just don't have the time to create the caring space for that new hire. But again, it's kind of getting in front of that before it happens and spotting it and helping the manager like bit by bit chunk, chunk a plan together, create an onboarding plan in a way which is manageable for them, in a way which is going to ramp up the person so that ultimately it's, it's worth the effort. Um, yeah, so generally, yeah. for me, culture, if you get the culture right, and if people know that we value and well-being is important, then, then everything else kind of follows. The long answer is hire managers that have the cultural fit for the organisation is one way, like potentially controversial. If you've got managers in place that don't get it, then we have to make sure that we're aligned on the vision and, and the culture is right. So we need managers to be to be to understand the culture that we're trying to create and we need to give them the tools to do that so that might mean doing some manager enablement but I, I think it's a partnership it's not all on the team leader to do that I mean that's I mean 
The reason that I'm really excited by the core week of onboarding that we have at Oyster is because everybody gets the same start, the same cultural briefing, the same vision, the same values. And in one way, that's great for everyone to have that core foundation. And another thing that's great is the managers don't have to do it because they're really busy and they've got their own stuff going on as well as onboarding. So I really like the fact that the people team, we build trust with managers. So we're not saying like, you've got a new hire coming, go and do onboarding. We're saying, look, we're going to do this big chunk for you. We're going to give you visibility of what that is. And at the end of day one, day two, day three, you'll know that they're equipped with this. So you can spend the first week getting to know them, getting excited. And if you need to change your plan for week two, week three, week four, you've got a bit of time. On to the next question. So how do you think, Gemma, we can explain the importance of a return on inv of investment uh, of these onboarding programs to execs who may be spe skeptical, so C-levels and execs? Ooh, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me is churn. Like, it costs a lot to hire the right person. So why would you not get the most out of them? If, if you don't have an onboarding program or you pile on the work too quick, we don't like intentionally plan how this person's going to ramp up, it's highly likely they're not going to stay. Or if they do stay, they're probably not going to be productive and you may then have a more managed departure later on. I mean, if you, if you want your staff to be productive, you need to invest. It doesn't necessarily have to be a financial investment. It needs to be an investment in the person. Now we want to talk about how we can transform this employee onboarding experience into a learning pro uh, process. And we need to recognize onboarding as a fundamental learning journey. So to achieve this, uh, we can leverage this four-step process centered around instructional design and also future-proof training. Um, this framework is designed to focus on how adults learn but also on ensuring you're hitting your company KPIs and cost efficiency. So Camilla, we have four stages. We have flip the pre-boarding process, which is any time you use before actually having a live session. So it's the resources that we share with people. It's, um, you know, what we do on Slack if you're using it as a learning tool. Uh, so anything you share beforehand, and then you can go over with the manager in the onboarding process. Um, the second one is leveraging social uh, learning, so social learning techniques, which Gemma spoke about everything you do as a process, as a journey with each other. And then it's how we set and how we measure the KPIs. So measuring completion rates, engagement rates, hours of training and quality. So this is everything we spoke about with post learning. Uh, how can we make our onboarding better? How can we develop it for the next time? Taking in all the feedback that people are telling us and the employees are sharing with us. And then how we can make this a lifelong process. So we want employees to feel like it's a journey. We want them to feel like they're fixing this with us and they're continuing this learning on to after the onboarding process. Now on to question four, Gemma. Have you used social, social learning techniques in your onboarding programs and what were they like? From a, from a learning space that I'm from, social learning is absolutely crucial. The interesting thing for me is how you, it, the definition of social. So for some people, social might be this conversation um, and that might be a really comfortable space for you to be in to learn. For other people, this might be a really challenging situation, especially when you're meeting new people. Um, as a new hire is going to be. So for those for those types of situations, it's how do we create a social learning space where everyone can flourish and everyone can have the chance to be vulnerable? A bit like all the thumbs down that we've, we've had today. That's a really, like, it's so sweet to see people putting those out there. We want to create a social space when we learn that we can be honest. So in terms of what, what, what I really love, I really love creating the one-to-one -one connection, building it to a a one to two connection, growing it to a one to three. I don't particularly um, enjoy the throwing people into a live session straight away because I think that's asking a lot. Um, what I really like is when you build a really tight set of connections from your first day and you grow your network and you grow your network and you grow your network in a way that you find comfortable. So give you some examples. Um, mentors, someone who can be a role specific or role um, have a knowledge of the role that the new hire is doing and be like a, a personal help desk. 
what you don't want to do as a new hire is have to draw on your manager all the time you just you just feel like you're draining them and you don't want to be draining your team because the last thing you want to be is asking them these tiny little questions so actually like having a a mentor who is saying look any little question even as tiny as like how do i whatever i'm here for that secondly buddies I, i love buddies cross department buddies who can give you the opportunity to learn about how you socially enter a company but it's one thing to learn the behaviors of how i do this process and how i use this tool but it's another thing to learn the social behaviors of how a company works especially like in oyster we're globally diverse we're in over 70 countries and um, and we're fully remote so with that socializing is very different to how it might be if you're in an office based in one country so when we have a new hire part of what they've got to establish is how do they socialize in in this workspace and buddies are great for that so having a a mentor for the formal stuff and a, and a buddy for the social stuff i think i think super powerful and i i did kind of talk about growing the social network i also love it when we can do cohort onboarding because i i love that learned experience together so um i i'm not a fan of like jumping in and socializing straight away because i think that's, for some people that's quite a challenge but when we can create a, a cohort based learning space maybe a workshop maybe a, an introduction to learning about um a certain principle in the company that's org wide and people can have that shared experience i think that's really sweet too alongside that async always so like have a slack channel wherever it is you communicate have that constant async space and if you're the learning person like be prepared to have to keep pumping that space with questions and polls and gifs and just letting people know that communication is really welcome to um yeah so they're, they're like they're the biggies for me that i always try and think of every time there are some cases where a webinar is great like when you need to give information to people and give people opportunity to chat and ask questions this is a great forum there are other situations where a workshop or a more collaborative space so i'm a, a most of the live learning i deliver is in a workshop format and the reason i do that is because using a mirror board or a jam board or whatever it is a, a virtual whiteboard allows me to get information out of people's brains onto sticky notes which i really value and it sounds very old school but sometimes um asking people to talk about their opinions that's going to take time especially when you've just started you've either got positive bias or you've got like a fear in starting a new job or like the social challenges of having to talk to new people i really like getting people in a space where they can comment like build connections slowly through small breakout rooms but for the most part get their thoughts on a page get them doing polls get them voting So um core sessions uh if we're not talking department specific onboarding like like revenue something like that core sessions might be around how we learn like how we navigate new situations like what it feels like to be in a new role and to not know what you're doing like um how how does that feel how do people approach that because the great thing about adults is we've all got experiences to draw from depends what you're going to be doing in the workshop that's a oh that's a spicy question Um thank you very much. Uh like if I'm going to be doing something where I'm I'm talking about a sensitive topic and I want to build trust, I probably want to keep that like kind of under 16 because then I can split people up into threes and fours. I like breakout rooms are usually my my um calibration. So, uh I when I'm talking about sensitive topics and I want people to share, I quite like to keep the breakout rooms threes. Threes is like fours at a max. Um and my reason is Uh, twos get awkward. Yeah. If you don't like if you got someone you don't get on with or you're not really sure, twos are awkward. Threes are a bit of a icebreaker and um, sometimes four just is too many people trying to talk for the time you've got. Um but in terms of how many people in a workshop, like when I'm 70, 80, 100, like I more the merrier. Um, I think it depends on if you want to give everyone a voice. What I what I definitely advise like on the workshops that I run where I've got like over 50 people is I don't let people raise their hand and jump in um which controversial opinion that might be um the reason I do that is because as soon as we do that it becomes the person who's got the voice gets their opinion across so what I will do is design lots of opportunities to put your opinions onto a page 
So what are the three essential signs or KPIs that show that an onboarding program is truly effective today? And why are they so important to you? I think I've mentioned one, and that's retention rate. Um, I, are people staying with the company past their probation period, whether that's uh, leaving of their own decision or leaving because of a performance management issue? Right? <clears throat> if onboarding's right, we should be setting people up to succeed. Um, a- another measure of that is performance management. Like, if their performance is um, uh, at standard, how like is it above standard? Is it is it below, but just a little bit? Like how, whatever your performance management cycle is, can you trigger that to happen at the end of like, uh, for example, at Oyster, we have a 30, 60, 90 day plan. And at 90 days, you get a full performance review. Like that performance review data is super, super important to grab hold of and to see where people are performing above or below role. I guess the other thing is is engagement and participation in the program. Like my, my example here that I like, the manager who on the first day of the new hire says to their new hire, don't worry about onboarding, just get in. Just, I, you'll learn it all on the job. Like, please know that like, it gives people time and space to ramp up and like to, to give value to onboarding. We want managers to go, whoa, don't have any work yet. The onboarding program is intentionally designed for you. So like getting sentiment from managers about their perception of onboarding, um, potentially controversial opinion, feel free to disagree chat, but I'm not a massive fan of um, engagement information sentiment from participants. Yeah, so um, if you ask if you ask a new hire, how was your onboarding? They're probably going to go, it was great because <laughs> they've just started and they're like, yes, this is it. I've got a job. I'm so happy I'm here. But what you actually want to know is how was your onboarding process? Like, did you feel welcomed? Like. Did you feel like you're engaged? Did you want to do the task? Do you feel like you're prepared for your job? For me, these are all questions that if you ask them at the end of the process, it's yeah. really hard to get a fair view. If you can go back six months later and say, now you've had a bit of time, like, did it do the job it needed to do? That's really useful. But I find when you, like, if you do a tick sheet, a survey at the end of an onboarding process, it's generally, everyone is very happy because they're just so stoked to be there and to start their job. In any situation where I'm trying to influence, uh, speak their language, not yours. So find out what the conversations are at C-suite. How are things presented? What is the data that they're consuming on a regular basis? And find out if your information can be presented in that way. Usually it's usually it's finances (laughs) which do the talking. So talking about attrition, talking about churn, talking about what will happen if we don't do this, that's probably going to be more powerful than the other side, which is what we can do if we do do this. Um, I, I sometimes think the risks um, presented in a data format are a really strong way of making the case. My, my take, my take is, is we it, like in general, we need to be moving on boarding to a more flexible and personalised place. So there is only so long we're going to be able to get away with this is your onboarding program. Off you go. Like the new generation that's coming through have had as much content as you could physically consume and more and they've had it when they want it they're used to information being there when they want it and they're used to a frictionless space to go and get it so like number one we are probably going to be moving towards assessing people more before they come into a role that might be during the candidate process Um, Take, for example, if someone's going to be working in a a fully remote company and they've never worked remote before, we're in a position now where we've got so much content, we can assess their remote working capability and then give them some more specific modules around how to get them up to speed, whereas someone else might not need that. So there's the customization piece. Like the learning person in me says that they're also probably going to need to learn about friction in learning. Um, And this this is a proper learning moment is that I think information is so readily available and you can be frustrating when you can't find it Um, so i think there's a position where we're going to have to slow people down a little bit and let them know that it's normal to have to work on something as you join a new organization to have to work to to learn because they've like they've been in an environment where things have just been available so easily Um, so that's going to be an interesting challenge i mean i I mean, AI is being touted as a solution to so many things. It may be that AI is there to help people walk through that. 
maybe there are other suggestions, more, more human-based suggestions. But yeah, I'm really intrigued as to how our programs are going to have to adapt um, over time.